happy Saturday, everybody. Since it is April Fool's Day, we are releasing a previous April Fool's episode as today's Saturday classic. That's the Tiara Asaya Tafferneys, which was acquired by the Louvre, but then turned out to be a fake. After this episode came out, we got some questions from listeners about whether we knew what happened to the families of the Tiara's creator, Israel Rushmovsky, who had fled from Russia to France to try to escape a series of pogroms. He died in Paris in 1934 at the age of 74, and that is where we wrapped up his part in the story because he had died. And we really don't know what happened to his family after that. We don't really know if they were still in Paris when it fell to Nazi Germany during World War II. It's possible that this is documented somewhere, but if so, unfortunately, it's not an information that we have access to. So if you were curious about that, unfortunately, we do not have the answer otherwise. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Today it's April Fool's Day. It is April Fool's Day. If you're listening on the day that the episode came out. (laughs) Uh, It's one of the days of the year that I want to love the most. But I find that I am a little bit picky about the level of uh, tomfoolery that I get. It has to be really good or I'm like, wah, wah, I don't want your sad trombone mediocre pranks. I want really good ones. (laughs) But because it is April Fool's Day, if you're listening to this the day that it publishes, uh, we have this auspicious calendar situation, so I thought it would be fun to cover a historical hoax. And as I was rummaging around for options by blind luck, I ran across one for which the date of April 1st actually figures into the story. And this is the story of the tiara of Saya Tafernese. And this story sort of plays out in three acts. So first, we're going to talk about the Scythians and how their artifacts became highly prized in 19th century Europe. And then we're going to talk about the hoax itself and how that all went down. And finally, we're going to talk about an artist who came into fame as a result of his sort of accidental part in this whole thing. In 1830, the archaeological site known as Kul Oba was discovered. Excavation started there. So this site is on the Crimean Peninsula, six kilometers to the west of the modern-day city of Kerch, and it was a burial mound. The Kul Oba site really fascinated the world when it was discovered because it was a Scythian burial site. So the Scythians were in the height of their culture from 900 to 200 BCE. And as a nomadic, tattoo-covered warrior culture, they touched many areas of Central Asia. Herodotus wrote about their fierce skills in battle, and they created weapons, particularly bows, that were far advanced over those of other cultures. They were so fast and mobile that they were able to swoop in upon enemy territory and deliver serious damage almost before anyone realized what was happening, and then they would vanish back into their own territory, leaving destruction in their wake. Even though they had a really nomadic culture, Scythians had elaborate burial rituals, Their burial sites were very deep with internal structures down in the pit, almost like cabins, and the coffins were placed into these. They wanted the dead to have everything they might need in the afterlife, so they also sacrificed horses to include in the burial so that the deceased would have mounts with them. And then, all of that in place, the site would be buried under a mound. And the Scythians, because of their warrior reputation and because there are still many gaps in our knowledge about them, remain a source of fascination for historians. And in the 1830s, that fascination and the discovery of the Kul Oba site sparked a huge interest in the collection of Scythian artifacts. Many of the items that were excavated from Kul Oba were beautiful, intricate gold pieces, and they ranged in size from small pieces of jewelry to larger works of often sculptural art. So there was just a scramble to try to attain these pieces, and they weren't always being sold through the proper channels to museums. They also wound up being sold off to private collectors, kind of on the down low, and The fact that the documentation of the artifacts that had been recovered from the site wasn't as meticulous as it should have been, I mean, the the knowledge that was pieced together from this effort became just kind of a picture with big missing pieces. 
That meant that it was not clear exactly what had been at the site, and that also hindered the analysis and the study of the culture itself that might have been gained from the discovery if things had been more meticulous and regulated. Yeah. I mean, even today, like when we have spoken with archaeologists, they talk about how imperative it is to document everything and catalog everything and its place. And in this case, uh, that was not happening very well at all. It was pretty scratchy and kind of catch as catch can when things actually got notated. And as a consequence, there's a lot of nebulous sort of theoretical stuff that, that people don't have any real evidence to back up. And all we have to study of the Scythians are these grave sites, which are called Kurgans, by the way, which, if it makes you think of Highlander, me too. Uh, Because of their nomadic culture, they just, they didn't have things like cities or permanent settlements. So the Kurgans are the only physical evidence that's left behind. And after Kuloba, there were more Kurgans unearthed. More than 30 years after this site was discovered, another one was found at Shertomlik in 1868. Yet another site, this one with multiple mounds, was called Seven Brothers, and that was found near the Kuban River in the 1870s. Both of these excavations even more captured the public imagination. Museums were extremely eager to get their hands on artifacts from the Scythian nomads, and it seemed like there could just never be enough excavation or discovery to satisfy this demand for artifacts became this really romanticized and kind of fetishized culture. So no matter what was discovered, people wanted more artifacts. Yeah, it was, uh, there was a little, a little bit of Scythian fever going on in 19th century Europe. And as the 19th century was coming to a close and all of this fervor was still carrying out, a very short article ran in a newspaper in Vienna. And this brief write-up told the story of a peasant, sometimes you will see this written as though it was peasants plural, from the Crimea Peninsula who had made an astonishing find of historical significance. So important was this item that they had found that the discoverer or discoverers fled Russia, fearing that this thing, which was not detailed, was going to be taken away by the government. A few months later, the Huckman brothers, who were antiquities dealers, held an exhibit in Vienna, Austria. That was in February of 1896. Their exhibit featured a number of rare items that were alleged to have been recently discovered in Russia. Just to be clear, a lot of the places that we're talking about in this episode, if if we were talking about today, that would be Ukraine, but at the time it was Russia. Correct. Uh, Among these was a tiara. And this is not a tiara like you would think of in the modern sense of the word with some kind of delicate or maybe ornate little diadem. It was a small domed helmet that was seven inches or 17.8 centimeters tall. It weighs about a pound and it's made of solid gold. Yeah, and it was ornate, just not in the way (laughs) that we would think of, say, uh, a tiara we might see on um, one of the uh, lovely wives of the Princes of England. So the widest band of decoration on this tiara shows scenes from the Iliad in carved relief. And then the lower band, which is not quite as as wide or tall, depending on how you want to describe it, shows scenes of life in the Scythian culture. And there's also an inscription inside the tiara in Greek, indicating that it is a gift from the people of the Crimean city of Olbia to the king of the Scythians, Cyataphernes. It was a fascinating piece, and it was shopped around by a dealer by the name of Vogel with the story of this clandestine journey out of Crimea, and he told this story to several museums in Europe. Vienna's Imperial Court Museum did not want this artifact, neither did the British Museum, but the Louvre did want it and did not hesitate when it was offered the opportunity to acquire it. So on April 1st, 1896, the Louvre bought this tiara for 200,000 francs. Yeah, that's the April 1st tie-in. It doesn't go any further than that. (laughs) It just is a nice bit of happenstance. And kind of prophetic. Yes. So now the reason that the British Museum and the Imperial Court Museum would pass on what sounds like an amazing find is pretty simple. Both institutions believed that it was a fake Uh, In the case of the British Museum, there had not even been an inspection. Simply the claim that it was from Olbia had aroused suspicion in London because that had often been used by forgers as a city of origin for fake antiquities. It was at this point roughly the antiquities trade version of saying you have a girlfriend in Niagara Falls that no one has met. 
And that perception that a tiara was not genuine wasn't exactly a secret. As a consequence, the press in France started running stories questioning the authenticity of this new acquisition at the Louvre, and the museum's reputation was also in question. So this started a very public battle over the whole issue. On August 8th of 1896, the periodical The Nation ran an article titled The Disputed Tiara in the Louvre, written by French archaeologist Salomon Reinach. It opened with the following paragraph. Quote, Seldom has public attention been roused, as it is just now, by a question of archaeological criticism. The tiara of Syataphernes and the gorgeous necklace purchased together with it for the large sum of 200,000 francs have become a favorite topic of conversation. People talk about them and judge them who had never heard the existence of Olbia, nor of the extension of Greek civilization to the northern shores of the Black Sea. Of course, as the daily papers have taken the matter in hand, much nonsense has already been printed about the tiara, and it is probable, the debate having only just begun, that we shall hear a great deal more of it. There was a lot of squabbling that erupted around this tiara, and we will get into some more of it in just a moment. But first, we will pause for a quick sponsor break. critics who said that the tiara was a forgery. Um, a professor Vaslovsky of St. Petersburg and German archaeologist Adolf Furtwangler were two of the most prominent. Professor Vaslovsky, who taught Byzantine and Turkish history at the University of St. Petersburg, was actually the first to publish a claim that the tiara was fake. Veselovsky had a good reputation, and even one of the supporters of the tiara as a true relic wrote, quote, Professor Veselovsky is not an urchin. He cannot have written such a note without having serious reasons to give. Furtwangler made the case that the tiara of Seataphernes was incongruous with other genuine Scythian finds from Crimea because it was dated much later. The vast majority of items that had been excavated up to that point were from the 4th and 5th centuries BCE, and this one was supposedly from the 3rd century BCE. Furtwangler's position was questioned because it was common knowledge that fake antiquities were coming out of Crimea, but he admitted he had not seen any of them himself. Yeah, so people were kind of like, so you say it's a fake just based on, like, the numbers, but you have never seen a fake to know whether or not this compares to them. Uh, (laughs) The August issue of Cosmopolis featured an article by Adolf Furtwangler dismissing any possibility that this tiara could be a genuine 3rd century BCE artifact. And then the next month, a counter to that article was published, written by the Louvre's curator of Greek and Roman antiquities, Monsieur Heron de Villefosse, and so began a years-long back and forth between believers and detractors. Critics brought up the pretty glaring fact that this piece looked way too pristine to date back to the time of the Scythians. There was virtually none of the damage that you would anticipate when examining something that old. Furtwangler did concede that some of the tiara was legitimately old. He thought that the two brass nails that were used in its construction were indeed antique. Even outside the Louvre, there were people who believed that the tiara was the real deal. That article that I quoted just before the break from The Nation goes on to state quite plainly that the author believed 100% that the tiara and the necklace it was purchased with both were, quote, perfectly genuine antiques. And the tiara's backstory grew and gained more detail as its status was hashed out, including in that article. So according to Reinach, the item came into the possession of a dealer at Ochkov, who tried to sell it to a Count Tiskiewicz before moving to Lemberg and then to Vienna for the exhibit that we mentioned earlier. Reinach made the case that no one questioned the tiara's authenticity when it was on display, and that it was only once money got involved that people started claiming it was a fake. He also said that he had been on hand for the meeting at the Louvre where the purchase was approved and that the committee present did very carefully consider the possibility of a forgery given the knowledge that Crimean fakes were becoming more and more commonplace. He also pointed out that a lot of the tiara's detractors changed their minds once they had seen this piece in person. 
Reinach went on to mention that the French public was prone to dismissing their countrymen as experts in anything and deferring to foreign scholars when he shifted from his critique of Ferdwangler to discussing Veselovsky. Quote, the public at large believed in the Russian's assertion. First, because a Russian in contemporary France is something more than an ordinary mortal. And secondly, because our public is always ready to believe that the officials of its own country are lazy or ignorant. I love that quote. I do too. <laughs> so because Veselovsky was Russian and Ferdwangler was German, the Louvre dismissed their writings on the matter that this was just an issue of national jealousy. This perfect and tidy nature of the piece had been the primary clue to its youth for its critics, but the Louvre claimed that made it all the more special as part of their collection because they had this relic that was in pristine condition. The press continued to skewer the museum, though, for more than six years over its insistence that the tiara was the real deal. Eventually, an editor at the newspaper, L'Entrange Again, named Henri Rochefort, made the case to the museum that everything would be settled if they just launched a thorough investigation and determined the tiara's origin. And as that was going on, the tiara and whether it was a forgery was international news. And what had initially begun as a debate in antiquity circles over these six years eventually reached even the smallest towns in the world. And that spread of information was what brought about a revelation in the matter in the form of a jeweler from Russia named Lifshitz. When this jeweler heard about the inquiry into the helmet's history, he remembered seeing a colleague working on a piece that really matched this tiara. His account of having seen the creation of the item that had been the center of so many public disagreements was printed in the newspaper Le Matin in Paris. And the man that he named as the creator was Israel Rushmovsky. Because he had a reputation for excellent work, Rushmovsky actually had briefly come up as a possible antiquities forger several years before all of this in 1897. A man named Monsieur de Stern allegedly visited Odessa where Rushmovsky lived and started a rumor that this man was creating forgeries. Rushmovsky wrote a letter to the Journal de Debat firmly asserting that he was doing no such thing, and that letter was published on October 3rd of 1897. But none of this had connected the artist to the tiara. It was just a case of a general accusation being leveled based on the fact that Rushmovsky was a very skilled metalsmith working in an area that was well known at that point for producing forgeries. The naming of a specific artist and a witness claiming that the tiara was fake was just explosive. Monsieur Aron de Vifos made a formal request to the French Minister of Public Instruction for permission to pull the tiara out of the collection and do a full inquiry. The minister granted the request and ordered a judicial inquiry as well. Once Rushmovsky's name was in the mix in the tiara controversy, the Louvre brought him to Paris for questioning as well. And as Rushmovsky told his tale of creating this intricate helmet, it implicated the Hawkman brothers. Rushmovsky said that the Hochmans had approached him about creating the tiara as a commission, claiming that they wanted it as a gift for a friend who was an archaeologist. And he was given reference material, books featuring Greco-Scythian discoveries, to base his design on. He was paid 1,800 rubles for this work. It is unclear what, if anything, by the way, happened to the Hochmans as a result of all of this. They may have been long gone because their name doesn't seem to come up in any accounts of what happened with this whole story after this. Rusmovsky described in detail the design and construction process he had used to create the faux artifact. He made it in three separate pieces that were fitted together and soldered in a way that was really carefully hiding the seams. Then he used a hammer to create some dents in the piece— Although he was really skilled and exacting in his work, these were the exact details that an expert would have noticed and factored into an analysis of the piece. One of the characteristics of the dents, which was cited as being an indicator of a fake, was the fact that none of the denting damage had been done to any of the detailed sections, only the pieces that didn't have any design on them. And then there wasn't any weathering other than the minor dings here and there. Yeah, the backstory that was kind of being used when this was sold was like, oh, those dents are from like a moldering crypt falling apart. And it's like, really? Because they have great aim. (laughs) Um, You would think that an artist coming forward and describing exactly how he made this forgery would close the case, but it did not, not quite yet. 
We're going to tell you what happened next and how all of this impacted Rushmovsky's life after we hear a quick word from one of the sponsors that keeps Stuff You Missed in History class going. While the artist admitting to the work that he had done on this forgery would seem to be a fairly conclusive bit of testimony, the Louvre wanted more proof. So Rushmovsky was given a sheet of gold and asked to create a piece of a fake Scythian tiara, basically create another one. And before witnesses, he did exactly that, and that proved the embarrassing fact that the Louvre had bought and defended a forgery. To be fair, when compared to other forgeries, Rushmovsky's work was so far superior and more convincing. In simply trying to make the best possible commission that he could, he had outdone those who had actually been trying to pass off their work as ancient. As all of this information about the hoax was circulating through the press around the globe, so was something else, and that was a universal admiration for Rushmovsky's work. Since he hadn't known that his creation was going to be shopped around as a historically significant find, and since he had been entirely forthright under questioning, his reputation was not harmed. So people didn't brand him a forger. That was sort of an unintended side effect of his making this thing. His work was described in articles as, quote, a very fine piece of goldsmithery. Rushmovsky sort of smartly brought one of his other works to Paris when he traveled there on the business of the tiara of Saitaphernes so that he could enter that other piece into the 1903 Paris Salon Exhibition of Decorative Arts. That piece that he brought is probably one that you have seen photos of because it occasionally gets passed around on social media kind of every couple of years. It's a tiny, tiny skeleton made of gold. It's only 3.5 inches long. That's about nine centimeters, but it has more than 150 parts and it's fully articulated. Even the jaw moves and it is highly detailed. The skeleton took him almost five years to make. He worked on it from 1892 to 1896. And then once he was done with it, he thought it needed a proper encasement. So to hold this skeleton, he also made a tiny, ornate coffin out of silver with a blue velvet lining. He worked on that for the next five years and then made additional edits over several more years after the 1903 Salon. The coffin that this skeleton goes in is so small, it's four and three-eighths inches long, which is 11.2 centimeters. It's so beautiful. It's one of those things. I have you, have you run into it on social media I over the think years? So maybe it's just me because I run in um, you know Halloweeny, uh, gothy, spooky circles. But um, it always comes up, and I've had it sent to me many times where people are like, "This is right up your alley." I'm like, "It is." Um, it is so spectacularly beautiful. And Rushmovsky was awarded a gold medal at the exhibition in Paris. And moreover, he gained the attention and favor of a number of wealthy art patrons, including the Baron James de Rothschild. And when Rushmovsky headed home to Odessa, he took with him several commissions for more of his astonishing and beautiful work. From 1903 to 1906, pogroms destroyed much of the Jewish community in Russia. Hundreds of Jews were killed during a pogrom in Odessa in 1905. Rusmovsky and his family managed to survive, but when he returned to Paris in 1906 to once again exhibit his work in the salon, he had an eye toward the future. He really felt that he needed to get his family out of Russia for their safety, and he wanted to relocate to Paris. Yeah, since he already had kind of a client base developing there, it just seemed like the smartest move. But it still took several years for Rushmovsky to execute his plan and get everything arranged. But in 1910, finally, he and his family permanently moved to Paris. He wrote his memoir in Yiddish, uh, and those were published in the late 1920s, and then he died in Paris in 1934 at the age of 74. And before he died, the artist created a miniature headstone for himself and his wife in which he engraved, A happy man was I in life. Peace and quiet, bread and clothing were always found in my home. I loved my work, my wife, and my home. Even after my death, my spirit will prevail as the work of my hands that I have left behind. The skeleton that Rushmovsky made changed hands from one collector to another over the years. In 1997, both it and the tiara were included in an exhibit in Jerusalem titled The Secret of the Golden Tiara, works by Israel Rushmovsky. 
On April 29th of 2013, that tiny skeleton was auctioned by Sotheby's, and it was expected to sell for $150,000 to $250,000. But when the bidding was all done, it went for $365,000. The Louvre did not get rid of the tiara of Saitophanes after it was revealed to be a forgery. Initially, they kept it tucked away in the museum archive. It was widely presumed that it would never see the light of day again. But in the years since then, its status as a famous fake has led to some public interest in seeing it. In 1954, the Louvre turned the institution's embarrassment into an exhibit and included the tiara in their salon of fakes that they assembled for a limited run. Yeah, there are also... I. I didn't write down the number, but I think there were eight fake Mona Lisas included in that exhibit as well, um, which I thought was a pretty good PR move, actually. The Louvre does mention the tiara briefly on its website as of today in its section on the history of the institution. In its section titled Sadness of the Belle Epoque is the note, quote, Two unfortunate incidents seem to sum up this difficult period. The 1896 purchase of the tiara of Saitaphernes, which proved to be a fake, and the theft of the Mona Lisa in 1911. Embarrassing at the time, but I feel like because everyone recognizes what a beautiful piece of work it was, at this point, a hundred plus years later, people are like, no, that's a valid museum piece now. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I wish we had a better picture of it available to put on our website. Uh, we the ones that we have access to are don't they're not particularly crisp, so they don't show all the beautiful detail. Yeah, there are better pictures of it floating around the internet, but we do not have rights to use them. So if you want to see more of it in its full gold glory, uh, you can do that. The uh, British Museum also has a copy of it that has some pretty detailed photographs on their website. So, uh, yeah, it's a interesting thing to think about an artist accidentally being so good at his work that he makes it very easy for a museum to be fooled without ever intending to do so. Yeah. Um, he just wanted to make the best possible gift for that archaeologist that was imaginary <laughs> that he could. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, as a consequence, all kinds of craziness erupted and fights and people. It's very, very funny um, that Reichmann article that I referred to talks about like, you know, the deplorable articles of other people that will not accept that this is the real thing. It's very funny. People got very, um, very head up over this whole, yeah, this whole well, tiara. <laughs> and it reminds me a little bit of the Piltdown Man. Um, yeah. And how fun it, uh, it was fun, but also, you know, it's, it's uh, disheartening that human nature is what it is sometimes, but it was it was fun to read articles about the Piltdown Man that was j just people talking with utter confidence about what this meant from a scientific perspective when it was, in fact, completely fake. Yeah, I mean, there are, are long discussions even now about, like, what percentage of, of pieces in museums are forgeries, uh, because odds are this is, you know one of, of many that passed mm -hmm. over the years. There are museums that have purchased pieces that, you know, have turned out to be um, forgeries, or there are lots of pieces that we probably don't even know are forgeries. Um, <laughs> and there are plenty in contention all day, every day as we speak. But again, so gorgeous that, in my opinion, it belongs in a museum anyway. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 